One, two, one, two, three. Dan Greider, Probable Cause. It is March 10, 2024. Glad to have you with us again tonight. Sunday night. It's our weekly evening accident recap for general aviation. Um, more good news here. We don't really have very much to talk about, so I've got a lot of filler material, but I'll put this graphic up on the screen to show you that we are somehow making progress i'm not sure who it is mostly internet but i think uh more social media more media more videos and more real-time crash information is helping people be a little more careful and think a little bit more carefully we still got a long ways to go let me put this graphic up here and show it to you here's my 10-year plan here and i'll show it here from 2019 through 2023 we closed out 2023 at 14.583 fatals per month that's general aviation in america in 2024 so far the goal has been 13 per month and as of right now we're at 7.84 now that's prorated right down to the day since today is march 10. so i did the calculation and figured out how many fatals we've had per day and then prorated that out to extend out over a year on this basis we're actually at 7.8 the goal being 13 but we'll take less is that 7.8 going to go up of course it is we have a lot of flying this spring and summer is our heavy loss months coming up i want you to think about this and be careful try to stay off of my sheets and stay off of these statistics it's a great insurance benefit to all of us but the big benefit to you is, is that if you'll do things right don't fly at night land off field select to land gear up off field open the door step out and call me go to dinner everything's good we can buy you another airplane it's not that big of a deal so we got a lot of material to do here tonight. I am going to talk about the uh, 11 for the month of January. Here they are. Here's the four for the month of February. And here's the three for what we have so far in the first 10 days of March. I'm going to save those for the end. I'm, uh, I'm going to make you sit through all this stuff and, until we get to the very end. This whole theme of this channel and everything I'm doing on this YouTube channel is no advertising. You should be able to watch this start to finish without having to click uh, skip or anything like that to do with advertising for the most part. It is straight ahead and I do have a straight ahead video coming out I hope next week. This has been a killer documentary style video for me to produce and I've got a long ways left to go on it, but I hope to have it done and uploaded next week sometime. It's called Straight Ahead. It's a standalone video purely about one particular accident and the theme for general aviation and helping think about realigning our ways of thinking and conditioning pilots to go straight ahead. All the AQP scenarios, everything that we're supposed to be doing, and I'm specifically going to talk about that with the uh, accidents that we had so far here in the month of March. Here's a little snippet. I just got back from Columbus, Ohio. I spoke to a group of pilots up there in Columbus. They had a very nice trip. Here's a very quick snippet of my speech up there. Uh, things got a little bit crazy. I played guitar and we had a lot of fun, a great dinner and a great bunch of guys. Here's a little bit of my speech concerning AQP from Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, I'll tell you what AQP is. Airlines used to have a problem. The problem was we were bending airplanes and killing people at the airlines which is not a good thing. In the marketing world, when you have blood and bent airplanes and dead bodies, that is not good. We don't want to do that anymore. All the airlines got together and said, what can we do about this? Well, let's take all the scenarios that have happened where we've spilled blood and bent metal. Let's figure out what those guys did. And let's turn them into check ride maneuvers. And I said, well, how are we going to do that? Well, let's petition the FAA to petition Congress so that we can write our own check rights. So when I got to Delta and I started doing this thing, they said, you're not going to do a PTS check ride. You're going to do an AQP check ride. So what is that? So, well, we wrote our own. And I said, you can't do that. You, you can't. The PTS is the PTS. I'm an airline transport pilot. You're going to go by the PTS. They said, no, sir, we're going to go by AQP. What's AQP? What's AQP? My golden nugget from tonight is meeting this guy 
who was one of the original developers of AQP up here in Columbus at NetJets. And well, you, no, were, you, were, you were at US Air, right? I built the, you know, well, I was part of the US Air AQP program back yes. in the 90s, yeah. The origins of AQP are with some of these core guys up here in Columbus, and I just ran into one of these knuckleheads right now. I've got a lot more information that I want to get out of this guy, but I'm going to let you go make your phone call. And sir, it was an honor to, oh, to meet you. It was an honor to listen to your uh, presentation. I appreciate that. I, uh, I, I look forward to uh, I'll be back. Get, getting on your, uh, I'll, you know, <laughs> watching your program you're gonna be from on my it. bedroom and uh, <laughs> you're gonna be, with a bottle of beer in my hand. You're so. going to be on it. But I want to come back and, uh, and when we both got a little more time. I want to talk uh, about uh, some stuff that we could do together here. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a hey, good night. Thank you. The time it takes to collect all this information, produce these videos, do all this kind of stuff is very time consuming. It's not super expensive. I've got all the costs to down to science. So to go to Columbus, Ohio didn't cost very much, but I do appreciate your support. If you would like to support one or $2, I appreciate that. That helps with hotels, rent cars, and food when I have to go out on the road and do all these things uh, to produce these videos. And I hope that you'll enjoy watching them. One or $2 is completely appropriate. Zelle, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo. If you're in the live chat tonight, you can do that right now, and I'll uh, try to call you out and give you a shout-out in the uh, chat room here, uh, uh, even a $1 uh, donation, and uh, it should show up instantly with your name. And if you'd like to include your very best insult, I'll try to copy that on there as well as fast as I can. Uh, typically off of a video, there's uh, 30 or 40 people that give a dollar or two, and, uh, and it's a lot of fun, and it provides um, enough expense coverage for me to go out and do these things. Let's get into tonight's video. You know, the first thing I'm going to talk about is NTSB. I've got quite a lot to say about this, specifically the Boeing Alaska situation. Our friend Jennifer was on TV uh, here this week and talked about Boeing. I want you to know these are data right off the NTSB website. There has been 151,000 general aviation accident investigations uh, dating back as far as the records go from what I've seen. How many recommendations has the NTSB produced out of these 151,000 accident investigations, they've only produced 457 recommendations. Now they think they're doing a better job than that. They think that they're producing a recommendation for every accident. Not true. General aviation airplane crashes and incidents are the lion's share of NTSB work. Like we're talking more than 85% of all NTSB function is devoted to general aviation. And yet we receive less than 1% of the recommendations. Here's an NTSB spokesman talking about how many general aviation accident recommendations he thinks that they produce. Since the NTSB has made over 5,000 recommendations for the transportation industry and uh, most of those have been adopted and uh, we look forward to hopefully uh, making more recommendations with this accident. Now, you know, Ms. Hominy got real excited about the Alaska thing. Uh, you got to remember that the function of the NTSB is to uh, investigate and determine a probable cause. Well, the Alaska thing, Jennifer, is over. The door fell off, and the reason was because the four bolts were not installed. This is not a quality assurance problem. This is not uh, anything that you need to go any further for. Let somebody else handle the infrastructure of quality assurance and things like that at Boeing. Your job is to d determine why the door fell off. You've done that. It's over. That's it. Jennifer is now wanting to go and find the names of the 25 people who might have touched the door so she can interview the 25 on why they did, didn't put these four bolts in place. I can tell you the answer why the four bolts were not put in place is because FAA didn't have a policy and a procedure in place for removal of the door and reinstallation of the door. Truth is, a guy named Steve was eating a tuna sandwich and he took the door off so he could do the riveting in a nearby section on that. He put the door back in and he forgot about the bolts. It's one guy. It's not a big deal. Uh, yes, he forgot. Yeah, that is a big deal, but that's that's not a quality assurance problem. And I take exception to Miss Hominy's comment, and I'm going to have you listen to it here. This is not a this is not an airframe problem in flight. Listen to what she calls this this incident in flight concerning the Boeing. I understand that members of the committee have a particular interest in our highest profile investigations, including the in-flight structural failure of a Boeing 737-9. She actually calls this an in-flight structural failure. 
it was not. This is a good airplane. They simply didn't have the bolts back in there, and one guy forgot to put them back in. Case closed. It's over. Sorry. Let's find the guy that did that and give him a little on-the-job training. Better yet, FAA, let's try to find a way to document door removal and reinstallation. That would be an FAA quality assurance function. Let's listen to Jennifer Homedy one more time talking about in-flight structural failure. Including the in-flight structural failure of a Boeing 737-9. Now, she wants all this footage, you know, the accident happened till, didn't happen till recently, but the airplane was built in September. She can't figure out how come she can't get video footage of the assembly process from back in September. Well, here's why. Um, on the security camera footage, uh, all their security camera footage is erased within 30 days and overwritten. Just, just to be clear, are you referring to the names of people who were working that shift, or are you talking about the documents? Uh, uh, the documents, they can't find it. The names, we haven't been provided. Now, the NTSB thinks that they're doing a great job. They're wanting more people and more money and more budget. They've asked for more money. They've been given a budget increase. Let's listen to how much the NTSB budget has just been increased. Chairman, while it's not as much money as you would have requested uh, this week, we're expected to, to pass the appropriation bill that funds NTSB and it's an 8.2% increase, which is significantly higher than most other agencies within our capabilities of, uh, of a, a budget that is less spending this, this year than last. I st strongly want that. You know, it's also very interesting to note that uh, the NTSB is supposed to have five people on it, a chairman, a vice chairman, and three other board members. Currently, there's a chairman and two board members. If you look on the NTSB website, Bruce Landsberg is mysteriously now missing. They're down to Jennifer plus two board members is all they have on NTSB. I'm not sure what happened to our vice chairman or the other board member, but they are gone. You're down to three out of the five on this, and I am not sure why that is. Maybe somebody has some intel on what happened to Bruce Landsberg or how come his picture is no longer on the NTSB website where you click on it. It says, who are the board members? It shows three of them. Bruce Landsberg is no longer on there. You know, Jennifer's asking for all this documentation from the Boeing plant. Well, there's a reason that she can't get the documentation. It's because it doesn't exist. Nobody keeps that kind of documentation. And here's a news reporter who made a really good summary. If you listen very closely to this, here's a summary about the documentation that does not exist. We don't have the records. We don't have the names of the 25 people that is in charge of doing that work in that facility. It's absurd. Boeing saying in a statement today they have given a list of everyone on the 737 door team to the NTSB. As for the documents, Boeing statement says if the door plug removal was undocumented, there would be no documentation to share. Of the 25 people that is in charge of doing that work in that facility. Boeing saying in a statement today they have given a list of everyone on the 737 door team to the NTSB. If the door plug removal was undocumented, there would be no documentation to share. Well, let's get back to a little bit more stuff closer, closer aligned to what we're doing. Part 137, that's ag and spray playing. We're not really keeping data on that, but I am. I have made a whole lot of crop duster ag friends out here in the Midwest and all that kind of thing. I'm very concerned about the safety of the ag pilots and getting them to slow down, be a little bit more careful in their turns. I had no idea, but some of these ag trucks and heavy ag spraying airplanes weigh as much as 16,000 pounds. You go out fully loaded and pull back and try to make a steep turn at the end of the runway. There's not much margin on this thing. Uh, let's try to be a little bit more careful. So far this year, we've only had one ag incident. I'm going to play the video for that right now, but this guy did a really nice job. He had an engine failure on takeoff. He took it straight ahead, landed in the trees, destroyed the airplane, but he is totally fine. Here's that report. Number two, the FAA now investigating a crop dusting plane that crashed in the community of Stratford. First responders with the Kings County Fire Department say a call for a down plane came in just before 1030 this morning near King and 19th Avenues. The pilot, who was the only person in the plane, is up and walking and is currently being assessed by medical personnel. Fire crews say the plane was carrying 250 gallons of jet fuel. It's unclear if it was also carrying a pesticide or any other chemicals. So as we go on for the year, uh, the ag inc incidents are not going to enter into our data, but uh, as 
especially the ag fatals. I'm going to show who it was, where they were, specifically if they hit a wire or stalled their airplane turning around. We want to know about it, and we're going to put those pictures. I hope that you guys will really be careful out there. Please, please be very careful turning your ag airplanes around at the end of a spray run out here. That's what's getting most of you guys is pulling too hard and flying way too aggressively. Let's slow down, take a little bit more time, and save some airframes and save some lives. Yes, I did just get back from Lane Aviation. I had a very nice, nice visit up there. I got to uh, be hosted by Lane Aviation up there, and I got a couple little snippets. Lane Aviation is the second most oldest FBO in America. Um, huge complex. I got to go upstairs in the Lane Aviation Control Tower. I shot a little bit of video in a few different places. Here's an interview that I got from the Control Tower at Lane Aviation. Now, this is not an ATC Control Tower. This is the Control Tower where they control fueling. And uh, Lane Aviation is responsible for 100% of the jet fuel sales, commercial jet fuel sales on the airport at Columbus, Ohio. And I found the person who runs that. Here's a cool view upstairs at Lane Aviation, FBO, full service FBO, 24 seven, probably a couple hundred airplanes per day get serviced with jet fuel from this office. Here's the brains behind it. Right here, this is Mary that keeps the whole thing going. And if you call in in your corporate jet, quick turn for 200, uh, 200 aside. That's you that answers the radio, isn't it? That's me. That's you. So pretty cool deal here at Lane Aviation. Uh, how long has Lane Aviation been on this field, do you think? Over 80 years, Brad, have we been here? Over 1935. 1935, so um, I think this is the second longest running FBO continuously in America. Now Mary here has been around here that whole time, all 80 years. <laughs> Mary has been sitting yeah. in this 24-7. <laughs> Eventually they're going to give her a break and let her go get a <laughs> cheeseburger or something, but she's been here for 80 years. No, it's a pretty cool deal, Mary, and I appreciate that. You've got uh, everything under control here. I mean, you're watching the weather, the airplanes, mm -hmm. the in yep. and out, and all that kind of stuff. Lane Aviation in Columbus, Ohio. Now, I also found uh, the guy that actually uh, hosted me, uh, uh, Sean, uh, invited me up there, Sean Bauer, and then uh, his friend uh, that works at Lane Aviation uh, has been in the same job for a long time. Let's take a look at this quick interview with this guy up here at Lane Aviation who's in charge of aircraft sales for Lane. Deep down in the inner sanctum of Lane Aviation, come across a guy here. This is Brad Willett. Brad, how you doing today? Hey, good, Dan. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is awesome. You know, a lot of a lot of history around here. And how long have you been here at Lane Aviation? Forty-one years. That's the same job title, selling airplanes since nineteen. If you've had the same job title for forty-one years, that tells me one of two things: you're either really bad, or they can't afford to fire you, or <laughs> there is something going. Forty-one years is a long run. And today, currently, your main function is sales. Head of the aircraft sales for the company. Aircraft sales, and you've got a lot of corporate customers that trade airplanes and move and they base here a lot of, i i just got a tour of the entire hangar facility here it's massive on this this whole thing right here but tell me about the history of lane aviation this is the second oldest so who is the founder of lane aviation foster lane founded the company in 1935 and we've been in continuous existence since then uh, the family still runs the company i work for the family and handling the aircraft sales it's amazing, and uh, we just looked on the map the uh, the location where Lane used to be, across the runway over there by the uh, by where the old terminal yep. is the right there. Back to the nineteen twenties, yeah. Yeah, back to the nineteen twenties. I mean, you're talking about the or original time when Columbus, when this airport was actually picked to be a landing site, when it was just a field. I mean, uh, this. A lot of grass runways back then. A lot of grass. Well, yeah. you say, do you have the field in sight? They were talking about the field. Yeah, exactly. The farm field. <laughs> the yeah. farm field. Yeah, do you yeah. have the field in sight? It is, it is a field. So anyway, Brad, I appreciate you inviting me up here. Well, thanks for coming to the PPA, the Professional Pilots yeah, Association, dinner tonight and being our guest speaker coming all the way up from Atlanta to Columbus, Ohio. So we'll have a good crowd tonight. We're looking forward to the speech. Hey, they said free food. That's why I'm here. It is. That's right. That's a long ways to travel for free food. Hey, you, you, you don't know. I brought Tupperware and everything, so uh, we're, we're all good. And plastic knives, plastic of course. Knives. Yep. All right. Thanks, Brad. All right. You bet, Dan. Thank you.
it was a very nice evening. Uh, the whole thing was very good. They had a very nice dinner, and everybody took very good care of me. Um, I, By chance, I got to meet Paul Ryan, who was the inventor of this Ryan Storm Scope. I mentioned him briefly. I had an uh, opportunity to visit with him just for a few moments. This is the actual Paul Ryan that invented the Ryan Storm Scope. Uh, Paul Ryan, right here, if you get a chance to get your picture taken with Paul, he's actually sitting right here, the, the developer. Every one of those little storm scopes that I ever saw, in the bottom right corner, it said Ryan. That's the guy. Isn't that cool? You know, Columbus is very rich in aviation history. Here's a terminal. They took me to see the old terminal, the original terminal from 1925 when the field was literally just a field. Here's a picture of me, and I shot just a little bit of video in front of the original airline terminal at Columbus, Ohio. I'm particularly interested in the history back from the 20s and 30s when aviation just got started. And your little town here is very rich in that history and I got just enough stuff in that this afternoon that I could capture and throw in a little bit. This is the original Port Columbus Air Terminal constructed in 1929. I'm going to try to fade a picture from this one into what it looked like in 1929 with the old airplanes in front but this building is still here today and now let me take you around and show you the historical marker um, sitting out in front of this building. So I've been back from that trip for just a few days. Uh, Dylan finished his second mag check on his airplane using his little laser thermometer. I'm going to show you that. Uh, just a little bit of interesting stuff here on how you can uh, take uh, a little bit of better health care with engine oil analysis and doing an occasional thermometer check on your cylinders by running your engine on one mag only and letting them warm up. This is an old trick we use on the DC-3 all the time because I've got 28 cylinders and 56 spark plugs. So keeping up with which plug is not firing from which mag is a big job. And this is the same technique I use on the DC-3 when there's 56 plugs involved. Here's this test. It'll only last a second, then we're going to get into the axes real quick. All right, so we're back at the Cherokee 140. We're going to do another temperature um, cylinder head temperature test today. So we're going to start the, uh, the engine up on the uh, right mag instead of the left mag. Uh, we did the left mag last time, recorded the temperatures. Now we're going to check the right mag and check the temperatures um, for the cylinder heads using the right ma uh, magnetos. All right, we're going to start the uh, engine and we're going to put it on the right mag immediately. Clear prop. Go park brake is set. About two thirty, two thirty one. Yeah, right about two thirty looks good. Kind of wavers around that range. So we're gonna go 230. Left front now. And left front showing a little bit colder, so about 215 here. Left front here is about 10 to 15 degrees colder than the rest of the cylinders. And uh, that's for, for both the left mag and the right mag. That's consistent for, for both of those mags. So uh, we can tell that we've got maybe uh, some sort of an issue that we need to keep an eye out for on this left front cylinder here. Okay, so here's the list for March. So far, we've just got the three. Last week, we talked a little bit about the one from Minnesota. Um, a very sad situation up there. Both guys in this Globe Swift up there were very experienced. Uh, our deepest respects and condolences. This, this tragedy up there... Uh, was devastating for all. I hope that we can learn a little bit about this and I label this as a mishandled abnormal. Everything I can tell um, from this airplane and the people that have called me to reach out to give me the story. Apparently there was three airplanes on this trip going to this destination. Uh, this airplane, the accident airplane, was the third to taxi out. They did taxi out number three, but they turned around and came back. I haven't been able to figure out yet why they came back or what the problem was, but they were last to take off and they were running significantly behind when whatever happened in flight. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, from 
everybody that I have talked to, which is completely unofficial and informal, it sounds like these both of these guys had more than 100 years of flight experience between them, but they were handed an abnormal in flight. Remember, aviate, navigate, communicate. When the abnormal occurred, this is just like playing roulette. Where's the ball gonna land? Let's say that uh, the roulette wheel is spun and we're gonna define black two as engine failure and route. If you have an engine failure in route, what's going to happen? Let's find out what happens on this roulette wheel. This is your takeoff. This is the chance that you're taking every takeoff on which AQP scenario you're going to be handed. I want to draw your attention to AQP number six that I've got in the document here. I'll show it to you. I'll put it on the board here, but I'm going to read a little bit out of here. This says, mishandled abnormals, emergency. An abnormal is any event in flight that is not considered normal and that could cause a pilot to be distracted by it, or if not properly corrected, that could cause an accident. Misprioritizing and giving the abnormal more attention than aircraft control is often the result. If you are flying with two people up front, consider immediately declaring who is going to fly and who's going to deal with the problem. It goes on to say here, depending on the severity of the abnormal, the situation may require that you turn the aircraft immediately towards an airport or suitable terrain. The next page here, over, over here, it says, uh, this this whole thing is, is spot on here. Consider a flight where your CFI manufactures a sample simulated abnormal or emergency during your flight and debrief how, did, how, how you did. Did you turn towards an airport? Did you lose heading or altitude during the process of dealing with the abnormal? There are numerous safe options for surprise abnormalities that can add real-time effects. Listen to this. Be aware of how distractions can cause loss of aircraft control. Be aware of how distractions can cause loss of aircraft control. I can't tell. There's no way to know. There's no flight data recorder, but it sure looks like the engine problem occurred. They did not turn towards the open field. They went straight ahead. They allowed aircraft control to become questionable. I think both guys, most likely, in my opinion, were probably troubleshooting very hard to try to make that engine run again. Aircraft control became questionable, and I'm very sorry. This is like playing roulette. Black 2 is engine failure en route, and it's what they got. That's where the ball landed. Let it, let it roll around a bit when it's left as well, so otherwise it will speed it back up. Just keep going. The next one is one I'm sure you all heard about, the Nashville. This is a heartbreaking story. Family of five on board this uh, Piper took off from Canada. The guy is a brand new private pilot in more airplane than he probably deserved to be in. Had his family on board. His last words were, I don't know. Let's listen to the final radio exchange. Nashville, up the in the emergency. My engine shut down. 30 seconds later, the final communication between tower and pilot. Runway two, runway two, clear to land. I'm too far away, I want to make it. She overflew the airport and then turned this. I drew this diagram on here. This is from ADSB. The yellow is showing where he could have gone if it had been daylight. This is a night emergency. And especially in a single engine aircraft and at night, which was this situation, uh, you don't have a whole lot of options when things uh, start going wrong. Whenever you have night around you, you have complicated your simple emergency by times 100. You can't see, you can't see where to go. Here's video footage of this airplane crashing and the fireball. You can see it descending into the embankment. Okay, we have newly released TDOT video. It shows that plane going down over the interstate. And then you see it right there, the fireball from that plane crash, brightening the sky around West Nashville. All I can say is, you need to practice for these. You need to be prepared. You need to know where you're going. If you're flying with your family on board, you need to have a hard and fast rule. No night flying in a single. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it unless you were getting shot at. Spend the night, go first thing in the morning, and any abnormal, you're going to have an abnormal. We're spinning this roulette wheel every time you take off. Which one are you going to get? We can't get these five back, but we can learn from both of these accidents. These are two fatal crashes. Here's a picture of the family, a tragic loss. Um, everybody in Nashville, uh, this was on the news. The, this is on the news nationwide, a horrible accident. I think it could have totally been prevented with daylight. 
here's the last one for the month of March, 4443 Golf. Out uh, in the Pacific Northwest, I have no information. All I know is that the guy was 77 years old. According to the Illinois Valley Fire Department at 1125 this morning, multiple local agencies, including the Josephine County Sheriff's Office and Oregon State Police, responded to a single aircraft crash in Cave Junction. It happened close to the Illinois Valley Airport. Josephine County Sheriff Dave Daniels says the crash killed a 77-year-old pilot after he lost altitude not too far from the airport. The plane got up to about a thousand feet and then made a, uh, a turn, according to witnesses, back towards the airport. Um, did not make it before it uh, rapidly started descending at about a 45 degree angle. He did make it to a thousand feet and they said that it stalled and spun and hit vertical. That's really all I know about it so far. And I, I wish uh, I wish I did know more. We probably will eventually here have a little bit better idea. But uh, that makes three for the uh, month of March. It makes um, a total of 7.84 average for the year, which is uh, which is really good. But let's try to keep that accident rate all the way down um, as low as we can go here. Let's try to go straight ahead. A couple of housekeeping items, and I'm going to get out of here. We do have some dad jokes at the very end of this, I think. I hope we will. If we can get them done in time, we'll try to get them on here. Remember, I'm going to be in Crestview on Saturday with the DC-3. I'd love to see you. It's free to go in the DC-3. If you want to come back out, that's five bucks. There's about four children that are still stuck in there from last year. Love to see you down there. They have a little breakfast down there at Crestview. Here's the graphic for it right here. And we should be able to uh, see you down in Crestview, Florida, Saturday morning. I'm going to get out here. Let's get this video up and on the air for my tiny little anybody fledgling YouTube channel, Dan Grider. Problem calls. You're going to have an engine failure on this trip. When it happens, you go straight ahead, full stall into whatever you want. Keep your shoulder harness on, open your door, step out, and call me. That's all you got to do. Straight ahead.